Hello and welcome to CEO Report Television. I'm Steve Lubetkin. Healthcare facilities incorporating real-time locating systems using Wi-Fi technology to track the assets and people in their facilities are discovering that Wi-Fi doesn't work too well for tracking patients, staff, and inventories. MGM Solutions, based in Woolwich Township here in South Jersey, is providing radio frequency real-time locating systems for hospitals around the country. With us today is Michael Mora, the company's CEO and co-founder. Michael's a U.S. Navy veteran. He's joining us today from Miami, where he's working on the implementation of his real-time locating system for the Veterans Hospital there. I'm pleased to have Michael Mora at the uh, table here today at CEO Report Television. Michael, welcome to the program. Thank you. Looking forward to the opportunity. Talk a little bit about the value of radio frequency, real-time locating services. Why is this something that hospitals need and why can't they use Wi-Fi for this particular uh, application? Well, first of all, uh, as we all know, ac uh, GPS is very accurate, but it only works outdoors. The only way to get around uh, being able to track RFID tags long range in a hospital setting is with radio frequency. And the lower the frequency, the more apt it is to penetrate the different materials of construction well enough to be able to accurately triangulate the location of tags. Wi-Fi operates at a very high frequency. And not to get too technical, but that high frequency is a very small sine wave and has a very difficult time penetrating most of the materials of construction in today's hospitals, and especially in the older hospitals. With the frequency uh, that we implement at 433 megahertz, again, not to get too technical, the sine wave is much larger, has the ability to penetrate the various materials of construction in a reliable fashion that we can accurately triangulate the location of RFID tags in real time. The benefit of that is that Tags don't slip through the cracks anywhere on a hospital campus. So we have the ability to track them in real time anywhere indoors and outdoors. And we're able to locate these tags to within five meters. What are some of the applications that hospitals are using this for um, in particular? How do you, how do you see uh, your clients using the technology to, to track tags and inventory and things? Uh, our solutions have many uses. Uh, the, the main use, uh, the most challenging, I would say, is for at-risk patients. Basically, we put a badge on Alzheimer's and dementia patients, and we can show patient care staff where their patients are in real time. That protects them and the hospital you know, from uh, added risk should an at-risk patient get out of the facility and nobody uh, on staff knows where that patient is. So our system basically will track them in real time, uh, protects them at the portals if they should get on an elevator and uh, they're not supposed to travel on the elevator, it'll lock the door, door down. If they get to an exit, it knows they're not supposed to go outside, it'll lock the door. If they happen to get outside, it lets the staff know exactly who and where they are, and then automatically will escalate to the police department. Now, once that infrastructure is in place, they can dovetail off of that same infrastructure to be used for wireless staff to arrest. That's for uh, staff that feel threatened on campus. Uh, anywhere they're located, if they feel threatened, they press a panic button on their badge, and this is a badge that they carry along with them. And it triangulates and shows the location uh, at the police department within five seconds so that they can respond quickly. Now that same infrastructure, um, because of the accuracy and reliability, is used for life safety, but can also be used for tracking assets. Uh, albeit that may be the lowest, um, lowest common use for RTLS, but having the ability to query and find your assets within seconds can be helpful when needed for servicing your patients as they need to service equipment for certification purposes for JCO requirement. Um, there are many uses of the technology, not least of which would be 
for workflow optimization to help the administration uh, get the patient cycled through the system faster, knowing how much time that staff spend with the patients in each of their designated areas helps them to identify the workflow bottlenecks and then put measures in place that increase efficiencies. Now, this is primarily used to track human assets. Is it used to track uh, other kinds of inventory as well or, or no? Absolutely, right. We have one of the modules that we uh, have installed as a web-based asset tracking system. And it's typically used by the medic biomedical staff. They query for their equipment. Within five seconds, they can tell anywhere within 7 million square feet where that equipment is to within five meters. So how did you figure out the need for this kind of technology and how to implement it in a way that would make sense for your clients in the, in the healthcare field? Uh, in the late 80s, uh, well, first of all, I should say we, we got our start back in 1987. Uh, we were working with hospitals uh, that were looking for ways that they could track their patients, uh, track their staff, the time that staff spent with the patients to uh, optimize workflow. Unfortunately, back in the early, late 80s and early 90s, you didn't have the, the RFID technology that you have today. Back then, it was a manual process. So to ease the process, you tried to develop patient tracking systems that were touchscreen, um, minimizing input where you could. And then as technology evolved so in the mid-1990s, we started integrating this RFID technology, starting with infrared, uh, and then in the late 90s, looking at Wi-Fi technology, but we found that the high frequency didn't work very well. Uh, and in experimenting uh, and, and doing a lot of engineering engine analysis with the various frequencies, we found that the lower frequencies were much better. Then in the early 2000s, we added low frequency RF at 433 megahertz, and then a third frequency at 125 kilohertz for portal protection. The combination of the three technologies allows the hospital staff to automate that process and completely eliminate all the manual intervention back from the early 90s when it was all touchscreen. Um, and this is, these are, are automated ways that they can track tags that are attached to people or things. Talk a little bit about the challenges of running a business that's based on a new and to some people who might be skeptical, uh, perhaps unproven technology. Um, what are some of the lessons you learned over the years? What are some of the adjustments you had to make to, uh, to bring things around to where, where people had more confidence? Uh, going back to, uh, I guess 2010, we presented engineering rationale on why the Wi-Fi, based on our experimentation in the late 90s and the early 2000, uh, 2000, why uh, the, the various healthcare would have problems trying to implement any RTLS, a real-time locating system, on top of Wi-Fi. Now, back at that time, um, it was very inexpensive. Everybody was looking to add Wi-Fi, you know, for the wireless networking capabilities that they would have in the hospital, and for good reason. You know, they needed to be able to share information between their different de various departments, needed to be able to eliminate duplicate data entry, and installing a Wi-Fi system made a lot of sense from that perspective. But a lot of the healthcare institutions were sold on being able to use the same Wi-Fi infrastructure for tracking equipment or for tracking patients, et cetera. And over the years, you know, they found that that obviously wasn't possible, but the low cost barrier to entry was still, most of those healthcare institutions were locked in that price mode. So our biggest challenge is trying to, to help healthcare professionals understand that using the best technology uh, available costs for the infrastructure, the initial infrastructure. But once the first infrastructure is in place, then they can dovetail other uses on that same infrastructure uh, to save costs. 
But the bottom line is they have to look at accuracy and reliability first. And now they've been, most of the healthcare institutions have been figuring out that the Wi-Fi is not delivering that accuracy and reliability that they had hoped for. So they're becoming less resistant, uh, especially in the VA, uh, to, to putting infrastructures in place that give them the benefit of tracking the tags, whether they're worn by people or things in, in real time, and that they're having to go outside of Wi-Fi. Now, your company is headquartered here in South Jersey, where I'm located. You're in Woolwich Township, and you're in Winona. What made you decide to locate the company in South Jersey? Was there a- I'm from the Philadelphia area originally. Uh, when I left the Navy back in the early 80s, uh, I, I uh, worked with a company called Intergraph Corporation. And Intergraph was a computer, a high, high-end integra- uh, I'm sorry, computer-aided design company. I serviced uh, companies like Raytheon, which at that time with, was United Engineers, uh, DuPont, all the, Del- the uh, departments of transportation, New Jersey, DelDot, PennDot. We uh, serviced all the nuclear facilities. And again, these were high-end uh, computer systems, the uh, mainframe computer systems that had a foothold in that area. And over time, most of those customers wanted to move or transition into PCs. And the company that I was working for at the time had thought that PCs were gonna die off and weren't going anywhere. And that's really where I got my start uh, and just kept the, co- it grew faster than I realized at the time. And then uh, before I knew it, you know, we had a, a fairly large customer base. Uh, we dovetailed into training uh, of AutoCAD, and uh, we grew our customer base to over 5,000 engineers and architects, including the Navy, uh, a lot of the engineering companies that I mentioned, and then it took off from there. So basically, the, I, I couldn't move the customer base, so I stuck uh, in the and, – and I love South Jersey, so <laughs> you have access pretty much to everywhere you want to get to and every – every sport that you want to touch on. So you've had a number of years as a corporate CEO and uh, a lot of lessons learned over those years. Um, What are some of the things that you try to engage in as best practices in your management style? What are the, what are the secrets of your success? I first try to treat everybody the way that I want to be treated. Uh, We listen to what the customer wants. Um, and then we take uh, all the experience that we have in, in our base and we draw from that to give them a solution that meets exactly what they fed us initially as the criteria you know, for the salute, whatever the solution may have been. So I think our success was, was built on listening to our customers and uh, not only delivering, but ensuring that we were always there 24-7 to support them. Uh, transition through new products and then evolve into uh, even newer products as their workflow models change or their business models change, we adapted and changed along with that. Any uh, lessons you learned along the way, things that you've learned recently that you wish you knew when you got started? Absolutely. Uh, Politics or so much uh, more uh, a part of any of the any of the um, growth opportunities and and not being aware of the politics that surround uh, your your opportunities to grow is is naive. Uh, what I know now, I don't totally rely on politics, you know, to uh, enter into our business. And again, I service the customer as number one. But having, having uh, an awareness, an acute awareness now of how the larger deals are done uh, at a top level, you need to get involved in helping to mold the process. And what I mean by that is not to try to put the fix in, uh, quite the contrary, but you want to make sure that you don't paint yourself into a corner with regards to new policies and standards that are put out by the administration that don't include 
your solutions. Ultimately, you're just going to paint yourself into a corner. And we've done that uh, over the past 30 years in business. We've done that a couple of times. And we hope that we're going to get it right this time. Uh, we have solutions that actually work. They save, save money. Uh, and now we're hopeful that we can connect with the people uh, that are making these policies, realize that, and, and uh, take advantage to partner with them. Any thoughts on the economy as we go forward? We're recording this program in early January of 2018. What do you see as the outlook for business for the rest of the year? I do believe that with all the tax benefits that uh, best were bestowed on the U.S. corporations, uh, that it's going to be a, a huge shot in the arm, especially in this, in this area. You know, we have quite a few large uh, U.S.-based corporations here that are going to benefit significantly. And uh, we see additional hiring, additional R&D. Uh, I think that this is going to be an exceptional year, one of the best years we've seen in the past 10, hopefully. Well, we wish you luck, and we thank you for taking the time today. Mike Morrow, the uh, president and CEO of MGM Solutions, thanks for joining us on CEO Report Television. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.